Welcome, folks. You're tuned in here to a National School Garden Network webinar on School Garden Networks. Uh, this is being presented in partnership by multiple school garden support organizations across the nation um, in collaboration with Whole Kids Foundation, who is helping um, co-sponsor these webinar series. So we can go to the next slide, Nathan. So once again, uh, this is the National School Garden Network. We're a loose collaborative of school garden support organizations. We define ourselves as a learning community of school garden support professionals. Next. We formed at the 2012 Farm to Cafeteria Conference to create a dialogue among school garden support organizations. We've got a website where you can find um, a nice forum. Next slide. It's a Google group forum um, and we've been we have about 400 members um, and we talk about all different topics related to school garden support orgs, which is different than an individual school garden practitioner. So you can search our threads or you can use our search bar in the top of the forum to look at lots of resources and dialogue uh, related to supporting multiple school gardens. Um, the folks that are part of our networks uh, are state agencies down to small nonprofits, to school districts, universities, foundations. Um, all the different types of organizations that work to support school gardens. Next slide. So this is our fifth webinar um, in a series of five. Um, you can find all our other webinars on our website and they're archived. And we also have best practice documents, which were created from a gathering we did about a year ago of school garden support professionals, where we looked closely at these five key activities of school garden support orgs, and we wrote down lots of resources on our best practice documents. So our first three um, webinars have their best practice documents up, and um, the next two will be posted re relatively shortly. So we'll get those up, and hopefully, um, well, not hopefully, we will be continuing webinars Ours in the future. We don't have our dates and times um, and our topics set out, but you'll be notified because we have your email. Uh, next slide. Um, we also create venues to gather as um, individuals face to face. And the next time that we're going to gather would be in, um, in conjunction with the Farm to Cafeteria Conference. Um, and once again, we will send out um, an email about that because now we have your emails. Um, and we only send out event emails. We're not a big spammer of some sort. We'll let you know when there's webinars or when there's future gatherings. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna pass it off to um, Tristana Perkle from the Whole Kids Foundation, who's gonna tell a little bit about who's on the webinar today and a little bit about the work that they do. And then we'll jump into the rest of the webinar content. Great, thanks so much, John. We're so excited to be here and help um, host these webinars and be a part of the National School Garden um, Network. Um, so just to share a little bit about Whole Kids Foundation, we support um, children's health and wellness um, by supporting schools and um, uh, inspiring families. And we just wanted to really quickly give you some opportunities for how you can connect with us to learn more, our social, our website. Um, and also we just wanna make sure that you knew that our, um, our grant windows are open. Our garden grant application is available until November 15th, and our honeybee grant application is um, the first half is due on October 31st. We are also having some webinars um, to talk through these programs. On Thursday, we'll be talking about the garden grant webinar, and, and Friday, we'll be talking about the honeybee grant. So be sure to join us if you're interested. Next slide, please. Just wanted to share some registrant stats of who is in the room. It's always so fun to see the reach that we're getting. Uh, today, we have three different countries registered, US, Canada, and Mexico. Um, in the US alone, we've got 41 states. And together, we all support over 6,500 gardens, um, although some of you support tens of thousands and like 80,000 gardens through your online resources. So we, we support a lot of gardens. Um, and these are all the different types of organizations. So, you know, the majority are nonprofits, but also school or district entities, school food service, philanthropic organizations, some school garden coalitions, cooperative extensions, um, and government organizations, which is kind of neat to see where everyone is from. We all are supporting school gardens in many different ways. Next slide, please. And now we're gonna kick off the School Garden Networks webinar. Um, I will pass it off now to Nathan. Thanks, Tristana. I'm Nathan Larson. I'm with the Wisconsin School Garden Network. 
And uh, as you as you see, our co-presenters today are also Rick Sherman with the Oregon Department of Education, Annie Silverman with the School Garden Network of Sonoma County, John Fisher of Santa Cruz Area School Gardens, and Drew Thomas with Chicago Public Schools. And uh, I, as I mentioned, I'm the director of the Wisconsin School Garden Network, which is a joint project of Community Groundworks, which is a nonprofit based in Madison, Wisconsin, and the Environmental Design Lab, which is in the Department of Planning and Landscape Architecture at UW-Madison. And you'll notice a, a theme of chickens on our shoulders and heads today. Um, that's just the kind of the way our presenters today have, uh, have come together. And um, the, the Organizations represented on today's webinar are the, um, as I mentioned, the Wisconsin School Garden Network, as well as Oregon Farm to School and School Garden Network, the School Garden Network of Sonoma County, Chicago Public Schools, the California School Garden Network, and the Cole Kids Foundation. And we'll, we'll give a brief overview of School Garden Networks, and then we'll go into five case studies of the, the um, previously mentioned networks. And then we'll conclude with some time for questions and answers. And Nathan, this is John. I'm just jumping in to let folks know, I didn't say this at the beginning, that you can post questions in your little control panel on the right-hand side of your viewer. You can type in questions and we will get to answer most of those questions as time allows. Great. Thank you, John. And um, uh, the document that John mentioned earlier that was created during the uh, School Garden Support Organization Institute in Santa Cruz last winter uh, will be available, as John mentioned, sh soon on the National School Garden Network Forum. And this is a, a little section of it, which provides a vision and overview of school garden networks. And there's other information in that best practices document as well. So just a quick overview of school garden networks. They can vary in geographic scale, focus, and size, for example, district-wide, county-wide, statewide, and national. They provide opportunities for garden educators to connect with each other, to share questions, ideas, resources, and inspiration. And they can focus on a range of common goals, including professional development and technical assistance for educators throughout the region, developing communications infrastructure, promoting grants and other funding opportunities, and working together on policy change, sharing events, and more. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this project, the Wisconsin School Garden Network. Uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a joint project of Community Groundworks and the Environmental Design Lab, as well as many other partners. And we received funding um, from the Wisconsin Partnership Program at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I wanted to begin with our, our, our sort of our origin story. This photograph that's on the front of our new website comes from the Troy Kids Garden, which is one of the projects of Community Groundworks. And it's really where our story began because we were we began a, a school garden program. It was a school and community youth garden program um, back in 2001. And as that program grew, we started to um, just realize that we had some things to share, things that we had learned. And so we started hosting um, workshops for educators. And as those grew, we started to, to realize there was a need for sharing around the state. And so we began sharing some of the things we had learned, some of the resources, and starting to partner with other organizations to share, to share what we had been doing. And what, what we were initially, um, we were funded initially by that same funder, the Wisconsin Partnership Program, prior to this new project. So our, our network, I should have mentioned, the Wisconsin School Garden Network just established last April. So we're a fairly new network. And what preceded that was this loose coalition of, of people doing school gardens around the state. And we began our model really as this more of this hub and spokes network model, where we had, as I mentioned, you know, resources to share and we were, we had trainings that we had developed and workshops. And so we sent staff out all around the state to pr provide workshops and, and share these resources and things like that. And through that process, we, we became aware of all of these school garden programs happening around the state, a little over 200. And of all the just interest in school gardens and and also that there was other hubs that were starting to emerge or have had been around for a while um, but people weren't necessarily connected with each other and so that really led us to aspire to this new model which is what we're trying to, to work towards over the next few years through our, our current project that we've been funded to do the wisconsin school garden network project and this dynamic network model is really about sustainability and and shared leadership 
uh, you know, that our idea is that we will end up with a more resilient and sustainable network that will that live past this this um, funded project that we have right now. And so the, the concept is that you have different hubs around the state or whatever region you're working in that are all active and some are bigger and bigger and some are smaller, but the, you know, each hub has something to share with other hubs and that there's a lot of reciprocity as you can see through all the different um, arrows there that there's a lot of movement back and forth. And that's, that's the idea is that we really wanna promote a lot of connectivity. And one of the other things that, that we're doing in that, in that vein is that we have five regional coordinators that are hosted by different partner organizations around the state. This is one of our regional coordinators up in, in northern Wisconsin, so right on the, the edges of Lake Superior. And the idea here was is that, that we wanted to partner with um, other colleagues that really knew their communities best, knew the needs and assets of their communities best. And with this model, instead of having one person leaving Madison to provide workshops and trainings around the state, now the regional coordinators provide the bulk of the trainings and technical assistance within their regions. And then we're trying to support them to, to learn about um, activity and, and other people doing school garden work in their regions that they may not know about. And so the pieces of that really at the heart of our project is connectivity. And so not only are we trying to provide a network that can connect people to each other, school garden practitioners, so educators and parents and others that are, are working in school gardens, uh, but also the school garden support organizations. And, and what we learned through our initial work is that there are a lot, many of those types of organizations throughout our state working at local, regional, and statewide levels. And so we're really trying to bring people together so that we can align our, our goals and, and efforts and um, Sorry, just pause for a second. So a little technical issue here. Um, so back into, uh, so basically that idea of bringing together lots of different, um, different partners together, and then also in really investing heavily in our communications and seeing the communications as a, as a important feature of be connecting people to each other so that people can share those stories and share best practices and ideas and inspiration. One of the other things that we really focused on is health equity in our project. And it's something that we're just beginning to think about. And, um, but what we know is that, that networks can be a powerful vehicle for, for promoting equitable access to school gardens and garden-based education. First of all, they have that ability to gather information about the entire region and get a sense of are there underrepresented or underserved communities or schools within the region and can start to think about um, you know, targeting resources or professional development, um, basically looking at are there, are there communities um, that, that, um, that might, as I said, might be underserved or underrepresented, underrepresented. And we would like to do a poll to see how other networks around the country are addressing equity through their work. So this question, how are you addressing equitable access to educational gardens through your network? Um, and you can select one or more of the following. And um, these are short, sort of shorthand, so I, I'll fill in a little bit more, but um, whether you're maybe be surveying or interviewing throughout your network or hosting different kinds of discussions on ways to best promote equitable access to school gardens or garden-based education. Are you providing targeted funding or resources for underrepresented or underserved communities or schools? Are you providing professional development? Um, and I should mention, are you doing this now or are you planning to? We'd love if, if you're not even, if you're not currently doing it, but you're planning to, please select these so we have a sense of what, what people might be intending to do as well. So if you're currently doing or planning to provide professional development or technical assistance uh, for underrepresented or underserved communities in your region, um, if you're developing and or providing resources in multiple languages. Or finally, if, if at this point, um, oh yeah, if you also, if you're addressing equity through your networks in other ways, and if this is the case, please select that. And then if you could email me, um, and that's Nathan at communitygroundworks.org, that, that email address will also be at the, at the final slide where we're gonna have all the different presenters' emails listed. 
So again, all right, so we've got, looks like 30% are surveying or hosting discussions. That's great, it's a great way to get started. And 65%, wow, that's a, that's a great number of us are providing targeted funding and resources. 37% uh, providing professional development and technical assistance. 49% are developing and providing resources in multiple languages and 23% in other ways. So again, please, if you have a chance, if you're, if you're um, addressing equity in other ways, please email me at nathan at communitygroundworks.org. Again, that email will be at the very end. We'd love to just get a sense of what everyone's doing out there and how we could um, share best practices. So we'll move back to the presentation. And here's another thing that we'd love to gather input on is youth voice and leadership in your network. Again, you know, thinking about how a network can really engage young people, both in, in getting input from um, youth throughout your network, as well as are you giving, you know, what kind of opportunities might be provided for leadership and um, just really having a stake in that network. And so we have another poll here. So, and I'll just talk through these again and just add a little more to each one. Um, again, select one or more of the following. Um, if you're serving youth or interviewing or maybe facilitating focus groups with young people in your network to gather input. Um, if you're providing internships, internships or job training programs for youth, um, particularly maybe for, for them to have some type of programmatic role within your network or um, at sites within your network. Um, do you provide an opportunities for youth to participate in network leadership meetings? So, for example, in the governance of your, of your network, are there ways that youth can be engaged? And, um, and then also if you engage youth in other ways. And again, um, would love to hear those ways to send that to my email address. And then finally, if you're not currently engaging youth in leadership development. We'll, we'll give a little bit of time for everyone to get a chance to to select all those that apply for this part of this poll. All right, great. So about 20 per second, about a quarter of us are serving youth or facilitating focus groups, that's awesome. 38% providing internships or job training programs. 17% uh, involving youth in leadership meetings. I would love to also to hear from folks that are doing that because um, we'd love to just collect all the different models in, which, in ways that youth are being um, invited to join in, in leadership. Um, engaging in 24% and other ways, would love to hear about those as well, and about 38% not currently engaging. Well, this is definitely, we're going to gather this data and we'll be trying to share this out with the network to see if there's ways that we can share, again, best practices and learn how we might all be able to engage more young people in, in our networks. And now I'm going to pass the mic on to Rick Sherman, who's the Farm to School Specialist with the Farm to School um, or with the Oregon Department of Education. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. And uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit of our the perspective of networks from our school gardens in Oregon. So next slide. Okay, so a lot of people think of Oregon as a lush green state. This is actually a true representation of a lot of Oregon. Um, there's a, a mountain range that divides our state. And on the eastern side, um, as is this picture on this gentleman here, he's tending in one of our school gardens in Oregon, not really, but, um, but we have a, a good half or two thirds of our state is um, very, arid and mountainous and doesn't get rain and stuff. But anyway, this is a good, good kind of shot of how people felt in our state at one point when concerned to school gardens. They felt like they were all alone and not connected with anyone. Next slide. Okay, what, um, this is what I have talked on before. I have seven steps to kind of unifying your state. And when I say unifying your state, it doesn't, you don't, 
have to tune out right now and think, well, I'm not going to unify my state school gardens. This could be your state, your region, your county, or your, just your town or your neighborhood. It, it works equally as well. But basically, first, first step is define, find out where your gardens are in your area, in, in one of those areas. Once you figure that out, you um, network with people and then you do stuff whatever you know activities you plan you relate to standards hopefully or or, or plan something um, for your garden members to do you invite people to your events um, it doesn't work to do something if you don't tell people about it so invite it and then you report report to the newspaper or you report to your school boards um, and then you build relationships with those people and then you have an ask so that's, that's what we found out has worked out really well in, in the past years. And that's, I can talk for an hour just on this whole subject, but I wanted to get that slide in here. Um, that's the method behind my madness here. Next slide. Uh, in Oregon, we currently have 669 school gardens. Um, we were the only state that knew exactly how many we had. We, we captured 100% of our gardens that we knew of. It wasn't always like that. Um, I started here in 2012 and um, uh, I was asked to share the story of how we did this. Um, the first question I asked was, how many gardens do we have? And somebody told me, oh, we don't know that. And you can't know that, it's too hard, so don't try to find out. So I, I took the attitude of never tell me I can't do anything. And I started calling every school in the state, uh, 1,300 schools. It took three months, 20 minutes a day. I wouldn't recommend people doing that. It's not really a best practice. I would say get an intern or two or five um, and divvy things up. Um, that would probably be the better way to do it. Um, but since then, we've had other states join in. Um, I helped Nevada and Minnesota. They have cataloged all their gardens, and Wisconsin looks like they're well on their way too, judging by. Nate's map there too, and um, Texas was getting in hold of me um, with a plan of interns and stuff. So it's slowly starting to happen. So this was the first thing is just defining where all of our gardens were. So now that we knew where they are, next slide, we were able to gather. So um, we used to have a um, Oregon Farm to School and School Garden Network annual meeting that um, we'd have about 40 to 50 people show up and once we had this list started uh, and we started e we had a contact for each person each garden we sent out um, individualized invitations to our school garden summit and we went from that small meeting to 250 and then 350 400 in rapid succession now i would like to take all the credit for that but quite honestly the farm school movement is really um taking taking off too. Oh, I was going to mention too, I forgot you guys. Um, on your little control panel where there's a dashboard and attendees and all that, there's also a handout section um, and there's a drop down arrow. There is a PDF um, of this entire thing you can print out as well. So I was supposed to tell that, sorry, forgot. I got too caught up in talking, shocker. Um, anyway, so so that was a, our school garden summit. We started inviting people and then people started feeling a little bit uh, more like they weren't alone. But something that came out of that was how could we even connect more in the neighborhood level? And so you see the picture on the left, we started doing school garden hubs. And this was about three or four years ago, our first pilot project we had in the, my hometown. I invited all the school garden folks in one town, one county actually together. And these folks didn't even know each other and now they're best friends. They did all these projects together. They reported on the school board. The school board said, we have school gardens. They didn't even know. But as a result of that school board meeting, we grew five school gardens in the next couple months. So it was tremendous, just the amount of work and camaraderie that could get done from these hub meetings. So next slide. And here is our hubs of that same map. Um, we have all the red circles. Um, um, people stood up and said, I want to lead, lead a hub in my area. We have still have some areas in particular um, Northeastern Oregon. 
Um, it just takes somebody to stand up and say, I'll lead it. Usually I'll get together and I will, I will start the first meeting and I'll invite everybody in that area because I have the list of names. And then I hand it off to people. Some people just get together for coffee. Some people just do m amazing projects, school board reports, um, school garden, um, open houses, um, what have you. The, the, uh, the amount of work that gets done in these are very greatly. Next slide. Here's a few of them, like they're, um, the one with the dog down at the bottom is in Central Oregon, and then the rest were peppered around like Lynn County and stuff. We have different p people in there, like mayors that are involved, the lady on the nice raspberry top. She's a mayor, mayor of Albany, Oregon, that showed up for ours. Um, but a um, lot of neat things happen in these, in these meetings. Next. And the really neat thing about this is uh, mo this model here for these hubs are free, no money associated with them. We did have one uh, one hub that was going to disband because I had a person from a nonprofit that was running it and she lost her job. And she said, oh, I don't have money to do that anymore. So I, I, we, can't, we can't have the group. And I kind of stood in there and I said, well, I'll, I'll run it in the interim, but there, it does literally take no money. You just invite people and you eat pea pods from the garden as a snack or somebody brings coffee cake or something and then you you um, just meet in one of your classrooms. And so um, that was kind of the neat thing about this is that the only money was my time um, and, I, and I have a paid job, so, um, so my job to oversee it. So this was, this was pretty nice. Uh, next slide. Um, like I said, if you invite people, you'll never and you'll never know who will show up. So think about some of these people. The the gentleman with the arrow. We went around. This is in Corvallis, where Oregon State University is, in Corvallis School District. And we had one of our hubs here, and we did introductions. And everyone's like, "Who's this guy?" And he turned out to be a school board member, and he showed up on his own, and he said, what do you guys want from the school board? And I'm nudging people saying, ask them for a paid school garden position, you know? And, and so someone said, uh, yeah, that, you know, and they, uh, in the next meeting, they had a district official there taking notes and trying to make it happen. So um, very powerful uh, way to um, get your school board and your community members involved in your gardens. Next slide. And that is where I will leave off. And there's my contact information there. And I'll be at the end as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Annie here with School Garden Network of Sonoma County. I'm continuing the chicken theme with this chicken that just leaped onto my head during a school field trip to a farm. All the children were very amused by my fancy chicken hat. I'd like to take a minute to tell you all about School Garden Network of Sonoma County and go over our origin story. We are a very small organization, we're a small nonprofit that began about 14 years ago. And it began as an organization of school garden coordinators and practitioners meeting up with each other informally to go over best practices and talk about some successes and share resources. And then over time, their organization grew and grew, and they wanted to formalize what they were doing. And as they listened to each other talk about what was needed, there surfaced two major goals. And one goal was to increase the food consumption that, of children, increase the amount of food from the garden that children were able to eat. And then the second was to be able to pay school garden coordinators partly to be able to then increase the amount of produce available to children to eat out of the garden. And that has really guided School Garden Network over the years and guided their funding priorities. School Garden Network has remained very agile and has a very small overhead. And as they've grown, they've really tried to fundraise and write grants to be able to then invest them back into the community. And that's mainly 
how our organization has evolved. We're at a point right now where two thirds of our staff are funded by one grant only. And we're trying to be able to kind of make a shift from having a very, very active board that's actually been doing and carrying out some of our programming to then including a little bit more expertise in fundraising and nonprofit management into our board to be able to make that transition from having our staff be mostly funded by one single grant to then being able to keep some core staff funded as we get different kinds of grants so we can increase our programming. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So that was a yeah, that was the overview of the background. Thank you. And I'd like to go over some of our current programming right now. We currently are able to give out a grant package. This is our second year of being able to give out this grant package. And we give it to five schools last year and then five schools this year. And it includes our Healthy Roots program, which is nutrition education and food preparation demonstrations in gardens, as well as healthy eating seminars to families and schools, field trip coordination, which is where that chicken hat picture was taken. And we are able to provide two field trips to five, the five schools that we award this grant to, mentoring to the garden coordinators and the $5,000 for a school coordinator salaries. When School Garden Network formed, they identified the lack of funding for school garden coordinators as a major roadblock. And so we try to be able to give money for, for, uh, for coordinator salaries so that they can work on getting their programs and be able to then seek support from the school after they have enough money to then get their program started. We have an affiliate school program, which is a free program that we offer to schools in Sonoma County. And we have over 70 schools that are part of this program. And as part of the perks of the program, they're able to apply for any of our grants, as well as they receive discounts to local stores, as well as donated goods from local stores. And we form those relationships with local businesses so that those that want to donate and offer discounts can have an organized way of doing so for school gardens and school garden programs. We also have a WaterWise grant, which is a grant that we partnered with Harmony Garden Supply, which is a local farm and garden supply in Sonoma County. And they donate time and they donate irrigation supplies and we donate time to be able to get irrigation systems into school gardens. We also have a school garden core, which was a pilot program this last summer. And we were able to employ teenagers to help maintain school gardens over the summertime. And a big part of what we do as well is hold school garden gatherings. That's the foundation of our organization. And that fulfills that desire that Nathan talked about and Rick as well, to be able to bring school gardens together. We have, we're a very large county with a lot of school gardens. So we aim to hold those quarterly school garden gatherings to be able to share best practices, as well as to be able to go over curriculum, ideas, and just network to be able to offer support and be able to see each other's gardens because so many people have these fabulous, innovative, creative gardens. And when they're able to see each other's, it can spark and reinvigorate people's passions as well as just to share ideas. And then we also offer training and workshops. And we have partnered with other organizations in the past to be able to host those trainings, as well as we internally offer some trainings and workshops. And we always try and provide those workshops at a lower cost so that schools, teachers, parents, anybody interested can participate. Next slide, please. So here's a map of the gardens that we know of in Sonoma County. And we have 99 school gardens within Sonoma County that we know of. And we, this survey was something that I conducted this year actually 
doing about the same thing that Rick did. I made a spreadsheet of every single public school in Sonoma County. And then I went through and I called each school and asked if they had a garden and asked if they had a garden coordinator and then got contact information for their garden coordinators. And the purpose of this was to find out who does have school gardens and how we can reach out and how we can help support those school gardens to get them on a map and to get the garden coordinators and their contact information also in one place so that we can further network. This uh, took quite a long time, I'll agree. And so our county is about more than 50 miles wide and more than, or sorry, 50 miles long and 40 miles wide. So we do cover quite a large area. Next. As a, a school garden support organization in the area, we do think about equity and we think about equity in two different ways. On the left, there's a picture of some sixth grade students at Lincoln Elementary School enjoying the pumpkins that they grew, exploring the insides. And Lincoln Elementary School is one of the schools that we awarded our grant to last year. Lincoln has a 87% of the children at that school qualify for free or reduced lunch. And our primary funding focus last year in giving out our grant was to reach schools that have high, high percentages of children that qualify for free or reduced lunch. And we, our goal or our desire was to be able to create equity, you know, economic equity, as well as be able to provide schools that might not have the same fundraising capacity a chance to have a school garden coordinator and then work towards trying to fundraise more to keep that school garden coordinator position going. And on the right is a picture of one of our school garden gatherings. Uh, next slide, please. This just gives a quick look at the schools that we granted our 2016-2017 garden grant to. And you'll notice that they are a high percentage have a high percentage of children that qualify for free or, or reduced lunch. And that reflects our funding priority. But we did run into a stumbling block in that our grant package is really most effective if we can award it to a school that already has a school garden going as well as already has a school garden coordinator. Because that way we're able to offer our mentoring as well as the nutrition education and cooking demonstrations in the garden to help build that program. And our stumbling block last year was that a couple of the schools we awarded the grant to had a hard time hiring a school garden coordinator and didn't hire coordinators until October and November. And so they just didn't have as much time from us receiving mentor, mentoring as well as they didn't have as much time to kind of build and institutionalize their program. So this year we ended up making it a requirement that all the schools we are awarded our grant to had to have a school garden coordinator, and we didn't get as many applicants from schools with those higher amounts of free or reduced children that qualify for free or reduced lunch. And so as an organization, we noticed that was going on, and we, in the future, will look towards writing grants that have multiple years of funding so that we can help grow a program and then support it over time. It's a priority of ours. And it's something that we look towards being able to achieve as we move on with our programming. And next slide, please. And here I wanna talk a little bit about the other, the garden gathering, garden coordinators and equity for school garden coordinators. As part of calling every school and seeing who had a garden and who didn't have a garden, as well as getting garden contact information, I conducted a study to find out how many hours a week school garden co coordinators are working and what their hourly wage is, and to figure out if school garden coordinators were volunteering their time as well. And this is the highlight, that the majority work part-time and they don't receive benefits or paid time off. The average salary in the county is $19 an hour, 
and many coordinators expressed working more hours than they were paid. So this survey went out to 99 schools and 33 responded. So this just gives a highlight of, or an overview of what type of employment school garden coordinators have in our area. And next slide, please. Unless money just rains down into our gardens, we're looking for some longer term fundraising and funding so that we can hopefully in the future see school garden coordinator positions that are comparable to teaching positions with a full time schedule, with paid time off, with benefits, so that we can widen the pool of participants that are able to take school garden coordinator jobs. And one way that we're looking at doing this is con continuous fundraising from our part, but it's also looking at schools local control accountability plans, which is funded by the local control funding formula, which is a way of designating money for schools. And so as schools are able to have some autonomy over how they spend their money. We're looking at helping schools right into their site plans, their garden, to be able to attach a line of funding for their garden. We're looking at trying to broaden the concept of how gardens are used to use them in, to write them into schools, mandatory wellness policies, to open up gardens as places for English learning, as well as to try and write into a a strong nutrition piece into the garden so that it can just be used more widely within the school and hopefully open up more funding to be able to then have full-time garden coordinators at each school. So that's what we're looking into the future for a longer term funding. All right, next slide, please. All right. So my name is John Fisher and I work with Life Lab. We're a 38 year old nonprofit based in Santa Cruz, started a school garden. We cultivate children's love of learning healthy food and nature through garden based learning. And I have two quick short stories to share. One, I was a part of the California School Garden Network, uh, one of the initial um, founders of it in 2006. And I just want to share a little bit about the power of having state partners because our, our network was made up of lots of state players. We're a huge state and all these different state agencies had an interest in school gardens. So the Department of Ag helped fund a book which is called Gardens for Learning, which we distributed 10,000 copies across the country or excuse me, across the state. Um, we had the Department of Ed that wrote grants through USDA Teen Nutrition Grants and some other funds they had to the tune of millions of dollars. And we trained about 4,000 people in farm to school through the California School Garden Training Program. And we made all these resources for the other organizations in their regions to replicate the trainings. And they got grants to do that. And that was all because of the Department of Ed uh, was helping us do that. Um, and you can find out more about those trainings at that lifelab.org slash CSGT. There's online training materials. And then along with that, because we were meeting with all these state agencies, the Resource Conservation District was there as well. And they're like, we wanna see people compost. We could lend our videographer. So we created a whole video series to assist in our trainings and for folks that couldn't come to trainings. Um, and it just went on and on, Department of Health was there. And so we had all these state players, um, they were applying for grants and awarding grants across the nation for preschool, or excuse me, once again, across the state uh, for preschool gardens and school gardens. Um, and then additionally, on top of that, all of us move, uh, working together, we kind of shifted legislation and we got $15 million for school gardens in 2009. And we gave out uh, 3,900 grants across the country, uh, just like 2,500 to $5,000 grants. They weren't huge, um, but that was all because we were networking as state partners um, who had the leverage to pull resources that some of the smaller nonprofits um, couldn't do. We also had industry programs um, like Western Growers, which is an agricultural trade group. They were on board to host everything. They created our website. They funded the creation of the website. They funded all the communications and newsletters. Um, and they found grants to give out to school gardens. And Ag in the Classroom was doing the same thing by hosting our calendar. So lots of great things are happening, but then the recession hit and state agencies can't travel during recessions. And 
our network was not as resilient as the models that were shared about hubs. So if we could do it all over, we'd have hubs. So where's the California School Garden Network today? Um, we have some great resources on our website. We've been rebranded by Western Growers, who is the person who is funding all this to be the collective school garden network to um, address the folks in California, which is part of their client base. But unfortunately, our huge state um, couldn't deal with travel restrictions during the um, during the recession. But some great things happened because we had state players too. We had Maria Shriver, the first lady of California, put in a garden in the Capitol before Michelle Obama did it a year before. And we had school garden week and the governor Arnold Schwarzenegger declared gardens in every school. So lots of great stuff was happening. So lessons learned, um, connect with state agencies if you have the opportunity. They have uh, leverage to pull in different sorts of funding and resources, um, but then also make your model more of a hub model rather than centralized. So I wanna go on to the next slide, please. And I'm gonna share just a little bit about our Santa Cruz area school garden network, which is pretty much an online Google group. We have an online forum. We have meetings from time to time. Those meetings have kind of evolved for folks setting up their own rather than me creating them. We host garden tours from time to time. And what we're looking to do is create more of like a match.com for school garden coordinators. So take a map model um, where all the gardens are, but then give attributes about those gardens. Like I'm an experienced garden coordinator who likes long walks on the beach. And then you say, hey, let's meet on the beach and talk about school gardens. Not quite a dating site, but a garden matchup site is what we're looking to do. Um, and we're also looking, if anybody has any um, experience creating a certification program, we want to create that as well to look at school gardens and um, not necessarily say you're a good garden or a bad garden, but um, use this as a census to understand what's going on and then give out awards for gardens that are doing things particularly well. So that's all about that I'm going to share um, right now because I want to make sure we get some good questions. Great. Um, so I will um, be quick. My name is Drew Thomas. I'm the school garden coordinator for Chicago Public Schools. So I oversee school gardens as well as farm to school. Um, I hope you like my poorly photoshopped picture of ducks on my head. More than just one is the way I roll. Um, next slide, please. So in Chicago, we have over 400 schools um, at this point with vegetable gardens. And uh, since we don't have a, um, a budget or a dictation of this is exactly how um, you need to build your garden, we have a bunch of different types of gardens. Uh, this is the network that sort of existed before we had a school garden coordinator and the, the network that will always exist um, regardless of what happens at the state or district levels. Um, it's a matter of you know how we how we organize it, how we bring these things together to um, to share best practices because um, there's no one playbook for all of these different models from hydroponic to tower gardens to community gardens, um, et cetera. Um, next slide. This is uh, our map of school gardens in Chicago. And uh, it, it lives on a website called quamp.org, Chicago Urban Agriculture Mapping Project is what that acronym stands for. And uh, I really always like to share this slide for two reasons. One, because um, it plugs that, that website, um, which is um, an attempt to capture all food production in the city of Chicago. So um, whether you're a community garden, an urban farm, um, a basement grower, a backyard gardener, um, or a school garden, um, you know, we try to capture information on here and you can filter it for different things. Um, you can fill, this is currently filtered for school gardens, um, but the reason that the filters exist and the reason this map is so great is um, because it highlights the density of food production in the city of Chicago. And um, the network that we have at in Chicago, uh, you know, really thrives off of the opportunities that proximity and density create. Um, and, you know, I say that with the caveat that um, from the dot on the very top to the dot on the very bottom in current traffic, it's about four o'clock p.m. in Chicago, uh, would probably be a, a good two and a half, three hour commute between them. So we still have to locate trainings and workshops um, around the city, um, but 
there's a lot of opportunities to do things, um, you know, within your own backyard, well, within your neighborhood for sure. Um, I also like this map because the way it works is it allows us to see that school gardens are part of a trajectory of urban agriculture in Chicago. Um, if you've got questions about your school garden, oftentimes there might be um, a community gardener down the block who has answers to that. You can coordinate seed swaps and share resources, all the great things that networks um, are, are wonderful for, um, you know, uh, make sense for school gardens to connect with other growers in the, in the area. Next slide. Uh, so our program in Chicago um, kind of became codified through my position um, around edible education. Um, we launched a program, the Eat What You Grow program, which allows school garden produce to be served in the dining center um, and to students in the classroom. Um, it's kind of a school-based GAP certification. Uh, I know our training materials live on um, Life Lab's website and are available online for folks to find. Um, but I, I say this because, um, you know, we were a blend of edible education and food production by design from the very beginning. Um, which is why, uh, you know, it, it's made sense from our network perspective to partner with folks who not, aren't necessarily in um, the education arena, um, but um, in, the, in the food production world. Um, next slide. Um, you know, this really hammers home what I, what I wanted to say about that. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a this is a map or a, a photo of one of our urban farms in Chicago City Farm with the Chicago skyline in the background. Um, and, you know, I use this because City Farm was a very um, it was one of the first urban farms in Chicago. Uh, and it really helped push the efforts and the envelope on institutionalizing urban agriculture um, at policy levels in Chicago. And, um, you know, that's what that's what having the coordinator position within our district has really allowed for. Um, it legitimizes a lot of the efforts that were already happening and continue to happen. It endorses a lot of the activities. We are able to, you know, review curriculum. Um, we're able to um, test, you know, test materials, um, things like that. But um, but it's really, it's really the way I look at it is, um, you know, the the school garden coordinator in Chicago gets to set the table, but everybody else is bringing their own dishes to the potluck, and everybody's everybody's eating. Next slide. Um, this is to give you a sense of the trajectory of the work we've done in Chicago. Um, we started in October of 2012. Um, by 2013, we had five schools that were um, part of this garden to cafeteria or um, harvesting program. Um, in 2013, um, sorry, in, in June 2013, we, we still didn't have a sense of where all the gardens in Chicago were, how many we had. Um, we launched um, uh, that intensively over the summer of 2013. Um, we evaluated over um, and identified over 100 gardens that summer. Uh, it quickly grew to around 250 just over there of the number of gardens we knew of um, at that time. Um, so you can tell that it's grown dramatically there. Uh, we then set off to um, to expanding our trainings and that school year we had 16 workshops uh, that we had met with partner organizations that were providing workshops and trainings and um, you know, there were 16 different ones. We made sure that we weren't doing our workshops on the same days, et cetera. Um, and then by 2014, we did our first coordinated conference because when you've got 16 workshops happening around the uh, city at, throughout the year, it started to make sense to do um, two conference style events. Uh, that way we could uh, lessen the load on nonprofits and um, educators who wanted to do trainings. Um, we made it easier for teachers to attend those trainings. Um, and uh, and um, everything was um, was pretty fluid. We then launched with our network and our partners to do um, community forums. And there we did a lot of our data collection, asking what was needed. 
Um, since then, we've really been scaling up the years after that um, in terms of coordinating our evaluations district-wide, um, dramatically increasing the number of gardens that we have, building out our programming in terms of farm to school and edible education and the resources that we're able to provide. Next slide. Um, this is an example of one of our tools. Um, see, and this is our Healthy CPS survey where we ask schools, school administrators to fill out um, a series of questions around health and wellness behaviors at their school. We've been able to include these garden questions and we share these results with um, the raw data with our partners, um, which is um, very beneficial to them. We go over, we, we've been in the past, we've been able to coordinate what questions to ask so that it's helpful to everybody. Next, and we can do this centrally as the district. Next slide. Um, this slide is our uh, observation tool. So we go and visit each garden um, or try to visit each garden, lay eyes on it and, um, and evaluate it in that sense. So this is an evaluation tool through Google Sheets um, or through Google Forms that um, all of our partners that were working in different schools or um, were in different neighborhoods um, helped us to fill out this form. And again, we shared all of the data collaboratively. We made sure that questions were um, meaningful to everybody involved. Next slide. Um, like I said, we do our biannual professional development. And um, the thing I wanted to add about that is that, um, you know, this is a great way for us to distribute resources centrally. Um, a lot of times we've had instances where folks are able to send us um, an immense amount of seed packets um, or um, you know seed potatoes for schools, um, but they can give us more uh, material if they don't have to ship them to individual schools. Uh, you know the same goes with our department. So having our professional developments centrally coordinated allows us to distribute resources centrally, and also it allows us to do our professional developments on um, teacher institute days, which means teachers are paid to be there. We're able to provide them continuing education credits and we're able to feed them on those days, um, which makes it a great opportunity for nonprofits who are um, in the business of providing trainings to teachers in this way. Next slide. The other thing that our network looks like is coordinated resources online um, that anybody can access. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of where some of our resources are. Um, these are best practices. These are links to grants. Um, these are PowerPoints that we do. We also have uh, the Green Teacher Network, which um, is what um, it's a Google group that allows folks to communicate, uh, people to announce things more, uh, more at a live, um, you know, as as they come up. Um, and one thing I do want to say is that um, one of the huge values of having our network um, be, you know, the coordination being assisted cent centrally is that we've been able to um, write school gardens into our current wellness policy that schools that are utilizing their gardens should be utilizing them, um, you know, at least twice a week or twice a month, that they should be eating food from the garden, that they should be doing things this way. And it now shows up on the school report card as to whether or not the school is doing this. So we're able to acknowledge garden programs and kind of incentivize, incentivize schools to use this, um, which helps our partners as well. Next slide. This last slide is just an example of um, an, a way where we were able to connect an elementary school and a high school. The elementary school students grew sweet potatoes and um, other crops and harvested them, delivered them to the high school where the high school culinary students made sweet potato burritos and practiced front of house and back of house service. Um, so again, a way of leveraging proximity. And that's, that's all for me. Thank you. So we are going to get to some questions and the bulk of your questions are related to funding garden coordinators. And I do know that we're coming up to the end of our time, but we will answer a few more questions. We will also have some written answers to these questions on our forum when we archive this website on the nationalschoolgardennetwork.org's 
website and forum. So the first question was about, um, or multiple questions was about how we fund garden coordinators. And specifically, there was a question um, to Annie in Sonoma, where do you get the um, grants to give out $5,000 grants for your garden coordinators? Before I pass it off to Annie, I do wanna share how we do it in Santa Cruz. We have a parcel tax for education that we vote measure P, yes, for the schools. And written into that is small funding, uh, part-time jobs, nine months out of the year for school garden coordinators at like $22 an hour at our four city schools. I've also seen a sub swap out model where our principal has sub release time for a teacher to be the garden coordinator like once a week or every other week. So those are ways I've seen that were sustainable. So um, I'll invite um, Annie to share how they get their grant funding. And if anybody else has ideas on how to create grants for garden coordinators or funding for garden coordinators from our presenters, we'd love to hear. Hi, we are able to give out that $5,000 to five different schools for the last two years due to a grant that we received from the USDA. It was a specialty crop block grant, and the mission of that grant was to be able to increase school and children's awareness of quote unquote specialty crops. In the past, when we've been able to hand out grants, we have had other USDA grants, we've fundraised. And those are the two primary ways that we're able to then turn around and give out those $5,000 mini grants to schools. Do any other presenters have any suggestions on how to fund garden coordinators? Well, this is Nathan. For our uh, citywide school garden network in Madison, uh, we have a gardener in residence model where garden coordinators are um, placed at different schools and um, fundraising is generally run through the parent teacher organization. And we've seen groups, um, you know, fund that through different, sometimes there's grant writing that's done um, by parents. Um, in, a, in a couple of examples, we've had money um, that's come out of the principal's discretionary funds for the school. And I know our colleagues, uh, City Sprouts, um, have that model in Boston and Cambridge, where they have a, a model of a school garden coordinator and then the the principals fund that position through their discretionary funding. And I think they do that at $8,000 a year for the school garden coordinators. Okay, well, I'm gonna go on to another question here. There was a question about how we um, identify underserved communities. Is there a metrics for this, a universal metrics for your state or for your region? Um, and this is specifically for Nathan, like how does your network identify underserved communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, we're um, a brand new network. And so um, we're just starting to, to figure that question out. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to collect information and would love to hear from people. Again, um, if you please email me, you can see the email address there on the slide, nathan at communitygroundworks.org about the ways that you're addressing equity through your network work. Uh, we would love to continue this conversation and think about how we can all collectively um, address this, um, you know, sharing best practices, but also um, looking at, you know, potential innovative new ways. Um, but I th going back to Annie's comments, I think definitely looking, um, you know, serving schools um, that have um, a, a percentage of students that qualify for free, energy, re uh, free or reduced lunch. Um, you know, I know some, some of our partners here in Wisconsin um, FoodWise is a program through UW Extension that provides nutrition education and is now starting to also support school garden work. And they're in any school that serves um, a, a percentage or 50% um, of students that are qualified for free or, or reduced lunch. Um, but I think there's a lot of other um, metrics that we, we should work on continue to develop. I don't know if any other presenters have assessment tools for figuring out best ways to identify underserved or underrepresented communities or schools in the region. Okay, well, I'm gonna end with one last question. And once again, all these questions that we have, we will put on our forum and our presenters and you and other folks that visit our forum are able to jump in and answer. So uh, the National School Garden Network Dot org you can link to our google group forum but uh, a question from melissa allen was what if you're just starting out and you're not sure who to include into your um, network um, where would you start um, where would you find folks in your in your net 
in, to, to start creating a network. And I'll just start by answering, you, you, I would think, of, look at all the players that would have an interest in school gardens. So health, science, waste reduction, clean waters if you're near a bay, and look for organizations that are interested in those topics and they might be interested in promoting school gardens. Do any other presenters have anything to add about where you, who you can put in your network if you're just starting out to find out who's interested in supporting school gardens in your area? Yeah, um, in this is Drew from Chicago. Um, and, you know, one of the things um, we were able to, you know, we had a, a, a good number of organizations that already were ex explicitly focused on school gardens. Um, but um, like I said, the, the urban agriculture world has been a, a big resource, um, as well as folks doing any sort of nutrition education or health and wellness education. So, um, which has led us to um, partners at food pantries, um, folks who do nutrition education um, around SNAP um, and LINK. Um, we have um, partners who do things around encouraging physical activity who um, and just generally getting kids outside um, have been good partners for this. So um, really the kind of health and wellness arena um, has um, had some really great partnerships for us. And this is Nathan again with the Wisconsin School Garden Network. I would echo um, those kinds of connections and, and also bring in the, um, you know, if you have an existing farm to school network in your region that you're not already connected to, um, as well as a, an environmental education or outdoor education network that's in your region or your state, school gardens really sit, I think, at an intersection of some of these other larger movements that are advancing um, you know, similar kinds of work and, and trying to, to provide these kinds of places for children to learn outdoors. And so really looking for those uh, like across um, sectors at, at other organizations or movements that have some similar goals and building those bridges for more greater impact in your region. In addition, this is Annie here. I would recommend reaching out to after school programs in some of our schools there's a program called cool school and they operate at many elementary schools and have programs for up to four hours after school and if they if there could be a relationship of a shared garden between the school and the after school programming that could help have a somebody that has paid time to be a steward of that garden as well as to get children involved after school So I'm going to um, ask Nathan to go to the next slide and remind folks that the dialogue can be continued and there's webinars related to many of these topics like assessment and funding school gardens all at the National School Garden Network.org and on our Google group. So I thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. We had close to 100 people on the call, which was great to share with folks across the nation and the world. So um, until the next webinar, uh, we'll see you again online and you'll hear from us via an email announcing future topics. Thank you to all our presenters and Whole Kids Foundation and to everyone that's volunteering their time to make these webinars happen. Goodbye.